1 Corinthians 2, verse 4, the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth. 1 Corinthians 2, 4 and 5. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I want to preach faith in the power of God. You may be seated. This is a message for everyone today. This is a message that works everywhere. I have the privilege of traveling across the world and see, seeing how God moves in wonderful ways. I want you to know this gospel works in every situation. Last September, I was in Madagascar, a large island off the coast of Africa. And there we had 15,000 believers in the annual general conference. We saw 2,075 people filled with the Holy Spirit in three days' time. There's a country in the Middle East that I won't name because of this is being broadcast and recorded. But in that country, it is illegal to convert to Christianity. It's illegal to try to convert someone to Christianity. You can be executed for that. So, obviously, we have no missionaries in that country. It seemed to be a closed country. But God knows how to make a way where there is no way. There's power in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some years ago, an immigrant from that country came to Canada, was converted, and became one of our ministers. He has a burden for his homeland. And so he began to preach on the Internet in his native language. People began to tune into that internet broadcast and he began to email with secure communications now he has a full-time ministry with a full-time schedule of services he tells people get your family together don't tell anybody outside your family what you're doing but at the specified time sit down and watch recently in the month of january we did a series of internet crusades special services in that language and then what he says when you're ready to be baptized take your vacation travel across the border to a neighboring country where we have more freedom to operate, where we have churches, make contact with us when you get across the border. We'll baptize you in Jesus' name and send you back to your country. So in January, we saw over 100 people baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost through an internet ministry in a country that's closed to missions. Praise God. Another country I won't name, I go there every few years for training. It's an extremely large country, but they tightly control religious celebration or religious, uh, in, in fact, even religious participation. The times I've gone, we baptize some people in a hiking up a mountain to get to a mountain stream and baptize people where nobody's around, wading out in the river as if we're swimming and getting out in the middle and baptizing people in Jesus' name, meeting them in the hotel room and baptizing them in the bathtub. And, uh, and so anyway, one of the leaders of that country where we have thousands of believers we don't even know how many thousands of believers we have. We know we have 50,000, but there are many more that we're in contact with because we're training the leaders. But we cannot have a formal organization because of the governmental restrictions. But anyway, one of the leaders, his son, is studying at Urshan Graduate School of Theology uh, to be able to go back to that country. And uh, he, t he went there for Christmas break, and he said, Brother Bernard, I'm so excited. We, we had a Christmas party. We had 500 people. And he said, we, my, my dad preached and gave an altar call. Forty-two people came, and we arranged them to be baptized. I said, I have one question. I've been there where, where to have a service, you meet in an apartment. You can't all come at the same time because it would be obvious there's a meeting. So over about an hour, hour and a half period of time, just one or two people will come at a time, and, and they'll walk or they'll take a bus, or if they, if they have a car, they'll park it. Uh, you know, several blocks away, or they'll come on a bicycle and they'll filter in. It takes about an hour and a half for everybody to come because you can't really make it seem like there's a meeting. So how in the world did you get 500 people at one time? And how did you have an altar call? He said, what we did, we announced a Christmas party. And we had a banquet, we had celebration, we had program. And then, we you know, when everybody got inside, then uh, my dad just got up and preached. So God has a church. There's power in the gospel. And so I'm preaching today in Atlanta, Georgia, and 
I'm preaching that we need faith in the power of God. We're thankful for this beautiful sanctuary. We're thankful for a pastor and leaders. We're thankful for an organization that helps us unite uh, to establish colleges and to have missions around the world. But our faith cannot be in a building. Our faith cannot be in an organization. Our faith cannot be in human beings. But our faith must be in the power of God. So the Apostle Paul wrote, if you go back to verse 1 of this chapter, you can see, he said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. So he said, I decided not to come with oratory. I decided not to come with philosophy. Because, in other words, he was saying, if I convinced you to follow Jesus by nice-sounding words and clever arguments, well, then someone else a month from now might come with even better-sounding words and even better-sounding arguments and convince you another direction. But I didn't try to use human ability. I tried to get myself out of the way so that you would trust in God, that your faith would be in the power of God, that God would work in your life. Because if God changes your life, if God sets you free, if God fills you with his spirit, then you can be established. It doesn't matter what comes your way. It doesn't matter what trials. It doesn't matter what philosophies. Your faith does not rest in the ability of humans. Your faith rests in the power of God and you will stand. Praise God. Now, don't misunderstand. Paul was not putting a premium on ignorance. He was not saying Don't study, don't train, don't prepare. Because if you look at his life, he was one of the most highly educated people of his day. He was trained at the feet of Gamaliel, who's known from Jewish history as one of the foremost rabbis of the first century. Not only that, he had an amazing secular education. I'm not sure if he formally studied or if he was able, he was bright enough to pick up things as he went along. But he was able to quote from Greek philosophers and poets. When he preached in Athens in Acts 17, he simply quoted from these philosophers to make his point, to connect with his audience. Now, in a day when there were no printed books, every book was handwritten for someone like the Apostle Paul to have first-hand knowledge of of some of these classical Greek poets and philosophers, he had to search it out. He had to take time. He had to study and he had to learn. So in this, when he says, I decided not to rely on human wisdom and human ability, he wasn't saying, don't study, don't learn. What he was saying in the context is this, whatever gifts and talents you have, you should develop them. You should train. You should practice. If you uh, are a choir member, you need to practice. If you are a preacher, you need to study. If you're going to do something in, in this world and be a good example of Jesus Christ and support your family, you need a, to, to, to get a skill or an education or a career or a, a vocation or something. You know, you need to apply yourself. He's not denying that, but what he's simply saying is this. Don't rely on your abilities and your talents to do the work of God. What we must have is the anointing of the Spirit. Do your best. Study, train, practice. We want excellence. But at the end of the day, it's not how well you sing or how well you preach. It's how much God can work through you to touch the lives and hearts of people. Our faith does not rest in our ability. Our faith does not rest in what we are capable of doing. Our faith rests in what God is capable of doing. Hallelujah. You see, if you come with a few questions out of my experience and training and study, I might be able to answer those questions. But you come with cancer. You come with alcoholism. You come with a divorce. You come with a a, a child in, uh, you know, a a young person in prison. You come with some of these problems. I, I don't have the answer. I can't help you. But I have a God who can. 
So I'm not trying to convince you of what I can do. I'm trying to convince you of what God can do. That's what Paul was saying. I'm going to do my best. But at the end of the day, my best is to point you to Jesus Christ. My best is to tell you God is the answer. I'm not the answer. I don't have the answer. But I can introduce you to someone who is the answer. Jesus Christ is the answer. Put your faith in the power of God. So he said in verse 2, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He said, I decided not to preach anything unless it focused on Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That, that may sound simple. It is simple, but it's not simplistic. The gospel is so simple that a child can respond and repent and be filled with the Holy Spirit. But it's so profound that we will spend a lifetime searching the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of Jesus Christ growing in the grace of of God. But think about this. Jesus Christ and him crucified, that is the foundation or that is the, the center. Everything we preach and teach, everything we do must revolve around Jesus Christ and him crucified. What I mean by that, when you preach Jesus Christ, you'll preach there's one true God. God loved us. He created us to have fellowship with him, to worship him, to have communion with him. But sadly, we sinned. We broke his word and we broke the fellowship that he intended for us to have. He could have destroyed us. He could have decided to create a different race. But instead, he loved us so much, he decided to redeem us. So God gave his only begotten son. Or in other words, God himself came in human flesh and human identity. That's Jesus Christ. When you preach Jesus, you'll preach one God. And you'll preach that Jesus is God manifested in the flesh to be our Savior. And then when you preach Jesus crucified, you'll preach that as a human being, Jesus lived and died. He paid the price for our sins. As you heard the choir sing, he shed his blood that our sins might be washed away. He paid the price for our sins to redeem us. But it doesn't stop with him being dead because he's not hanging on the cross today. When you preach him crucified, you'll tell the rest of the story that he died. He was buried in the tomb, but he rose again the third day. When he was raised to the dead, he turned defeat into victory. He won victory over sin, death, and the devil. And if we will believe on him and obey his gospel, we can share in that same victory. Now, when you preach Jesus crucified, you'll preach the death the burial, and the resurrection. But you won't just leave it 2,000 years ago, what happened in Palestine. But you'll say that needs to apply to our lives today. How does that happen? The Apostle Peter explained it on the day of Pentecost when people ask, what shall we do in response to your message about Jesus? He said, repent of your sins. When we repent, that means we turn away from the old life. We make a commitment and a decision to surrender our lives to God, to live for him. That is a death to the old life. That's a death to the sinful life. We die to sin in repentance. And then he said, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. The Bible tells us we're buried with Christ in water baptism. When we're baptized by immersion, That symbolizes that the old person is now being buried. The old sins are being washed away by the blood of Jesus, which is why we always call on the name of Jesus, because we know our faith is not in the water. Our faith is not in the preacher. Our faith is not in the ceremony. Our faith is in Jesus. If Jesus doesn't do the work, nothing's going to happen. We're just going to get wet. So that's why we say, in the name of Jesus, I now baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the washing away of your sins. We're buried with him in water baptism. And then the Bible says we rise to walk in newness of life. How does that happen? Through the living spirit, the same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead. That spirit enters into us and gives us new life now. So when we preach the crucifixion, we'll preach death, burial, and resurrection. We'll preach repentance, water baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But it doesn't stop there. That's the beginning. That's the entrance. But Paul wrote to the Galatians that we're crucified to the world. 
We're crucified to the flesh. What does that mean? When we live for the Lord, then we don't live for the world. When we're alive to God, we act as if we're dead to the world. So when the world tempts us, which it does, we refuse to respond. When our own flesh tempts us, which it will, we refuse to respond. We act like we are dead to the sins of this world, to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. In other words, we're seeking after and pursuing the holiness of God. And we're making commitments and decisions of our life to ward off the lust of this world. Because we want to be dead to the world, but alive to God. So when you preach Jesus Christ and him crucified, you'll preach repentance, water baptism, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You'll preach living a holy life. You'll preach there's one true and living God. You'll preach that Jesus Christ is the almighty God manifest in the flesh. In other words, you'll preach the apostolic message. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Everything we preach needs to be based on that central truth. Faith. In the power of God. When we preach Jesus, then we can focus people's faith on what God has done in Christ and what God will do in our lives today as we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, faith, we make it much more complicated than it really needs to be. You know, every human being lives by faith in some sense of the word. The fact that we are even here today, we're having faith in something. Just as simple as coming to church. Most of you probably rode in a vehicle, uh, but probably most of us cannot really explain the internal combustion engine. And those of us who can probably can't explain all the electronics that they have in those automobiles today that make all these things work. And yet we put the key in the ignition. We turn it, even though we don't understand how it works, we can't explain how it works. We just have faith that it does. We set the alarm clock. To have just enough time to get ready and to calculate what going 30, 40, 50, 60 miles an hour, whatever, how many minutes it takes to get here. We don't calculate, you know, the car's going to break down, so, I, I, you know, I need to hike an hour uh, or I need to, you know, wait for the city bus or I need to, you know, we don't make our plans based on it's going to fail. We make our plans based on it's going to work. And depending on how good of a car you have, most of the time it works. By faith. Most of us don't understand how electricity works. We don't really understand how the electrons flow and how they hit the filament and cause photons to come out of the light. But we just turn on the switch, expecting it to work. So we base our whole day on the fact that electricity is going to work in our house. And if it doesn't, well, then that's a major crisis. So we live by faith in the natural all the time. We trust things we cannot see. We trust things we cannot understand. We trust things we cannot explain. But we just assume it's going to work. We plan our life accordingly. We depend upon it. And most of the time it works out. If we would take that same ability and turn it in the direction of God, we could see God work miraculously in our lives and in our families. Faith in the power of God. I think sometimes we make faith so much more difficult than it's supposed to be. We try to muster up faith as if the more I strain and agonize, the bigger my faith and the more will God will answer. Or since I don't have much faith, if I can find some famous faith preacher, go on the radio or TV or go find them somewhere across the country. If I get the right faith preacher, then I'll have great faith and then God will do great things. You're mistaking The object of faith. You see, the power of faith is not in your brain. The power of faith is in the object of your faith. I was raised in Korea. My parents were missionaries there. And on occasion, I visited the Buddhist temple. I observed people in their worship. And I do not say this critically, but just factually, that people would come to the Buddhist temple with their request. In fact, on Buddha's birthday, They would bring a paper lantern. Each lantern represented a prayer request. And the the temple courtyard would be filled with thousands of lanterns hanging. They would line up uh, outside the little statue of Buddha on his birthday. And they would take turns with a dipper of water pouring it on Buddha. Giving Buddha a bath for his birthday. That was considered a way to get a blessing. They would come throughout the year to this giant statue in the temple. 
They would bring offerings of incense, candles, um, fruit, flowers, and so forth. Food for the priests. They would come and pray. I would watch them. They would stand very solemnly, raise their hands above their heads as high as they could. Bow down slowly and elaborately all the way to the floor, their head touching the floor. They would stand up and do that maybe 100 times, 200 times. That's a lot of faith. Probably as much faith as we have. I'm not being critical. I'm being complimentary. But they would turn around and leave with the same sad expression on their face. They would arrive at home with the same problems that had, they had had before they went to the temple. Why? They had faith. But their faith was in a man who died, was buried. That's the end. Their faith was in a statue of metal that had eyes that couldn't see them, that had ears that couldn't hear them. So it's not about having great faith. We should have faith. We should have great faith. But the point is, if all you have is just a little faith, don't think it's hopeless. Because after all, it's not your ability that's going to get the job done anyway. It's not your brain that God is going to depend upon. But if all you have is a little faith, put it in the direction of a great big God. And even a little faith in a big God could result in something good. And then your faith begins to rise. And then there is no telling what God can do. Never underestimate the power of God. Never underestimate what God can do in an apostolic service just like this. Anything good can happen in the presence of the Lord. Anything good can happen when you pray in the name of Jesus. Faith in the power of God. Now, if you think I'm getting a little too speculative here, Jesus said something in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. I'll quickly go there. But there was a man who had a son who was possessed of demonic, a demonic spirit, and uh, he would have seizures. He was at risk of dying because unexpectedly he might have a seizure and fall into the fire, fall into water. So this man brought his son to the disciples of Jesus, asked them to heal him. They prayed, nothing happened. Then Jesus came along, so the man asked Jesus to help. Jesus rebuked the demon, healed the boy. The prayer was answered. So the disciples came privately later and said, Jesus, why couldn't we do this? And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place. It shall remove and nothing shall be impossible to you. He said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, the mustard seed to give you an illustration, just take a look. Well, actually, it's the head of the size of a straight pin, so you can't see it anyway. You don't know if I have it or not. What the Lord is saying, don't measure your faith by human quantities, but use it like a seed. Now, think of the mustard seed or any other kind of seed. If it sits there in your hand, if it sits there in the bag, it's of no use. For all intents and purposes, it's dead. It's inert. Uh, if you served it for a meal, it wouldn't feed you, much less your family. It's useless. But take that same dead seed and plant it in the ground. A plant comes forth. From that plant, hundreds of seeds. You reap those seeds, you plant them again. Eventually, you'll have a harvest that can feed you and your family year after year for the rest of your life. What's the point? Faith is like a seed. No matter how big or small it is, if you don't use it, it's worthless. But no matter how big or small it is, if you'll put it in the ground, if you'll take a step of faith, if you'll step out of your comfort zone, if you'll step out of your knowledge and your experience, if you'll step out of yourself and trust God, anything could happen, and nothing is impossible. We've got to take a step. We've got to plant the seed. Matthew 7, 7, Jesus said, Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened. 
All of you know that, right? If you have it memorized, I'm sure. If you don't, just remember A-S-K spells ask. A stands for ask, and when you ask, it's given. S stands for seek. When you seek, you find. K stands for knock. When you knock, it's open. So you just memorized it. No problem. You even memorize the reference. Matthew 7, 7, 7 is God's number of perfection. So you got that too. Now think about that. James says many times we, ask, we don't have because we don't ask. We need to simply ask. That's why we come to church. That's why we pray. That's why we worship. We're putting ourselves in a posture of saying, Lord, I submit to your will. There's an old chorus we used to sing. When you've tried everything and everything has failed, try Jesus. That is a great evangelistic song. If you're in jail ministry or street service, you know, you tried alcohol, tried drugs, you tried Eastern mysticism, you tried sexual immorality, you haven't found uh, what you need there, try Jesus. But it's a horrible song for Christians to live by. But I think most of the time that's what we do. We make our plans, we go about our business, do everything. It doesn't work out. We say, Jesus, why doesn't this work? He said, well, you probably should have asked me first. Don't wait till the last thing and when you tried everything and everything has failed, try Jesus. Why don't you go to the Lord first? But you say, I've asked and nothing happened. Well, don't give up. You're supposed to be more aggressive. Seek. See, asking is just standing there. Seek is you're walking around. You're getting a little more active. We said, still nothing happens. He says, knock. That's more active yet. Now, think about it. If the door is open, you don't need to knock. You knock because the door is closed. I wonder how many times we're trying to do God's will. We feel like God has spoken. We come up to a closed door and we say, okay, I I give up. I quit. Circumstances are against me. must not be God's will. How do you know unless you knock? Maybe it's the devil fighting against you. Maybe it's just circumstances of life. You'll never know until you try the handle. You'll never know until you put your shoulder to the door. You'll never know until you dock. What might be a closed door could open up when you start praying intercessory prayer. When you start asking, seeking, and knocking, the doors that are shut can open. God can shut the wrong doors and open the right doors. But you'll never know unless you ask, seek, knock, plant the seed in the ground. All different ways of saying, put your faith in the power of God. Don't be limited by what you understand, what you think, what you can accomplish, what your friends can accomplish, even what your pastor and church can accomplish. Don't limit yourself by what you think we can do, but have faith in what God can do. Jesus, in the same context, but I'm using Luke's version, he said, you know, we human parents, although we're sinners, yet if our child comes to us asking for fish, we won't give him a snake. If he asks for an egg, we won't give him a scorpion. If he asks for bread, we won't give him a rock. He says, if we have enough sense not to do that, Luke 11:13 says, how much more? Shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? God actually wants to bless us, but we have to ask. God wants everyone here to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's, it's the will of God. It's a promise and it's a command. There's no reason why every single one of us can't be filled with God's Spirit. That's God's plan. He wants to give that good gift, but we have to ask. We have to have faith in what God can do. I could give you many stories, but I'm coming to a close here today. I'll just give you a few. October 2013, St. Louis, Missouri, our general conference. And a great spirit of worship. At the conclusion, I would say probably 90% of the people stayed for 30 or 45 minutes after the preaching in worship, prayer, and praise. It was a powerful conference. In the midst of that prayer one night, a man came to me with his daughter, about 10 years old. He said, Brother Bernard, I want to tell you what just happened. My daughter was born deaf in one ear. When we found out there was a problem, we took her to the doctor. The doctor found there was no hole in that ear, so it's physically impossible that she could hear. But he said, tonight while we were praying, my daughter came over to me and she said, Daddy, I can hear out of my ear. 
He said, I went and whispered in her ear to check it out. And she's right. She can hear out of that ear. God has miraculously healed my daughter. Another man came up. A son, about four years old, says, my son was born with cystic fibrosis. He struggles for every breath. While we were praying, I looked over and I noticed my son was breathing clearly. So I observed him for a while. And then I brought him to my wife to see what she thought. She says, we we have concluded God just healed our son of cystic fibrosis. Now, I believe that testimony. The same thing happened in our church in Austin. A little girl like that. She was completely symptom-free. Her parents took her to the doctor, and the doctor said, there's no cure for cystic fibrosis, and she can't be healed. And so they said, what happened? He said, well, she's in remission. So every year for the next however many years, they would give an annual checkup, and he would say she's in remission, permanent remission. That's fine. We call it healing. And then my wife got a Facebook message about a week later. A lady said, I came. In a wheelchair. I've been bound to a wheelchair for many years. My pastor brought me to the general conference. She said, I was prayed for. I was able to get up out of the wheelchair. She said, I've been walking ever since. God has healed me. An Indian lady was invited. She was Hindu. The Hindus, of course, worship many gods. But she was touched in the service. We had a portable baptistry. We had the video there. Thousands of people watched as she was baptized in Jesus' name. God filled her with the Holy Spirit. She began speaking in tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. Now, look, I'm not telling you what happened 2,000 years ago. I'm not telling you what happened in some far-off distant land. I'm telling you what happened in October 2013 in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm pretty sure if God will work in St. Louis, God will work in Atlanta, Georgia. It just seems like it. My my phone says it's going to be minus two degrees when I get to St. Louis tonight. So I, I think if God can work in St. Louis, I really feel God will work in Atlanta. I think it'd be easy for God to work here today. Let's stand together. Faith in the power of God. God's not quite through yet. So would you be in a spirit of prayer with me right now? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just close your eyes with me. Every one of us, let's, let's just be in a spirit of prayer for one another. I want to first make an appeal. If there's someone here today that you may need to make a decision to live for the Lord, to submit your life to Jesus Christ, the Bible calls it repentance. Would you mind coming right up to the front, kneel or stand? I know they have people who are trained to pray with you. They won't embarrass you or intimidate you. They'll just pray with you. And while I'm talking, maybe you feel led to ask your friend or, or neighbor to come. It would be okay to say, would, would you like to come with me? Or I, I would like for you to come with me. I want to come forward to pray. So you could come together. If there's somebody here today that you feel you need to make a definite commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to come right now. Now, I'm not going to take very long. It's going to be very simple. But while I'm talking, I want you to come. If there's someone here, maybe you've already done that, but you've never received the gift of the Holy Spirit with the initial sign of speaking in tongues. That means speaking miraculously in a language you never learned. It's not just gibberish. It's not something you imitate. It's something God does in you. You begin praising him, and suddenly your praise changes to another language or different words. You have to speak out because you have to praise him. If you, if you have repented of your sins, maybe you serve the Lord, you know the Lord, but you've never received the Holy Spirit, I want you to come right now. In a few minutes, God will fill you with the Holy Spirit. You just need to have an attitude of surrender and repentance. And once you've done that, you need to begin to praise and worship him with your voice. And he will fill you. Is there someone here today? I feel like I should ask this question. I hope somebody's coming. Is there somebody that needs to be renewed in the Holy Ghost? You've known the Lord in the power of the Spirit. But you need a personal renewing. I'm not saying you're backslidden or living in sin. I don't know what you're doing. But if you feel like you need a brand new touch from God. A renewing in the Holy Ghost. I want you to come right now. Would you do that? As people are coming, I ask for our prayer workers to help us, our leaders to help us.
The Lord wants to do something specific here today. Come right now. If you need the Holy Ghost, come on. You need a new start, come on. You need a renewing, come on. Now, is there someone that needs healing? Someone you're facing a crisis in your family? Someone you have an urgent financial need? It's not just generic. I know every one of us have prayer requests, and there's not room for every single one of us. But if you have an urgent need that you need an answer from God today, why don't you come right now? We're just going to trust God. I, can't, I don't have any power, but we're putting our faith in the power of God. God can do a miracle this morning. God can do a miracle before you leave. You can receive an answer to, from God in prayer right now. All across the building, even if you don't come up, I think it's still early. Would you take a few minutes to pray where you are? Maybe you'd like to sit or kneel or stand. Maybe there's room for some others to come. Pray for one another where you are as you're led by the Spirit. Focus your faith on these who are coming. Let's take a little moment, a little time. Let's put our faith in the power of God. Put the seed in the ground. Take a step of faith. Do something to express your faith in God. Let's pray together.